Thank you so much, Lucy, and thank you, Debbie. This is uh, Melody McKee with the Behavioral Health Institute, and we're going to do just a couple of introduction slides before we move to Dr. Four. Uh, Debbie, thank you for getting us started in a good way, and Lucy, thank you for the land acknowledgement. Um, so, Behavioral Health Institute is um, excited to be here today in partnership with the Northwest MHTTC -TC to provide our second training um, to Indian healthcare providers across Washington State and in our in the uh, Northwest MHTTC's region. And our presenter today is going to be Dr. Four. Before I introduce him, I'm going to just, just give a couple words about the Behavioral Health Institute and the program um, that is offering. Our partnership in this training is the Training Workforce and Policy Innovation Center. Uh, the Behavioral Health Institute is a center of excellence where innovation, research, and clinical practice come together to improve mental health and addiction treatment. The BHI has several programs listed here, and the Training Workforce and Policy Innovation Center is the program specifically offering this. Next slide, please. Okay, so let me, I'm going to give an introduction for Dr. Four before we move to um, Christina, who will tell us more about the Northwest MHTTC. So our presenter today, Dr. Chris Four, is currently the director of the Indian Health Services Telebehavioral Health Center of Excellence. He is a member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. He received his doctorate in child clinical psychology from Oklahoma State University. In 2009, he established the IHS Telebehavioral Health Center of Excellence. The mandate of the center is to explore the feasibility of telebehavioral health within IHS, regionally and nationally, improve access to care, develop models of care, and to address sustainability. And now I'll hand it over to Christina. Great, thank you, Melody. I'm so humbled and honored to have you all with us for this very important topic. I just wanna share a little bit about our center, which has the fortune of um, cooperating with this effort. So I work for uh, the Northwest Mental Health Technology Transfer Center. It's a very fancy, goofy name, but it's basically uh, offering training and technical assistance to Region 10. And so we proudly serve Alaska, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. We target the behavioral health workforce and do a variety of things. Things. Next slide, please. We are part of a national network that is funded through SAMHSA, and so we have Region 10, and there are regional centers all over the U.S. and other territories and such, and then there's a national coordinating office, as well as there is a National American Indian and Alaska Native Specialty um, Center that it has a lot of resources on their website, as well as a national Latino and Hispanic center. Next slide. The kinds of things we offer are very similar amongst the other TTCs as well. We have websites with um, events, products, and news, and you can learn about events such as this. We have live trainings, archived webinars, we have practice sheets, and online courses that are self-paced and all free. So all the things we offer are free to everyone. Next slide. If you want to stay in touch with us, we'll certainly put a couple of these links in the chat as well near the end of the training, but we have a newsletter so you can hear about events that way. Social media, give us a shout via email if you have a question. We're happy to answer and we want to be there as a resource for you. Next slide. This is something that the entire network um, recently released, and it's just a matter of remembering to always use affirming, respectful, and recovery-oriented language in all our activities. And so we just want to always make sure that we're speaking in an inclusive way and respectful way that supports recovery and healing. And also be mindful around language because this is being recorded and we will post um, this later on our website. So please just don't use any identifying um, confidential information if you're talking about um, any of your work. Next slide. We're going to go through some logistics at this point. So you might notice that we have a chat box, and that is really just from you to our training team and logistics team. It's not amongst each other. Um, but you uh, can use that for logistical questions. You're having trouble hearing, something is cutting out, um, you're having trouble you know, with something, we can respond to you there. Next slide. 
for questions, what we'd like you to do is actually put those in the Q&A box. So you'll see that at the bottom of your screen as well. Um, you can raise your hand and someone can get uh, that um, to you when we get to the question and answer period. Um, or you can just type in your question into the Q&A window and either someone might type in an answer or save it for when Dr. Four is um, answering questions at the end. And I think what, what's two more, I think, I think next slide. This is really important for us and our funders, um, but it's especially important for the folks that put this together. We are really excited and always welcome your feedback. And so we worked really hard to get this together. People are really um, amazing who are doing the presenting and we just wanna know how did it, uh, how was it received by you? And by doing that, it's confidential, takes just a couple of minutes and it would be great to um, do that. And uh, we'll send a link um, at the end of the event and we'll also email you as well. I think, yeah, so that's uh, what I just said. We'll share it in the chat box. There are no certificates or CEUs for the series. Slides, recording, and resources will be posted after the session. Just for folks that are asking about last week's session, we have not been able to process those things just yet. So it does take a little time, but as soon as we're able to, normally we'll email you all with the resources once we've had them up on our website. And that's enough for me, so thank you. On to Dr. Four. Thank you. I appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to present to you all, to talk to you all, <clears throat> excuse me, about Telebehavior Health. Uh, last week was, we had a, a, my part was just a general overview. We had lots of other uh, experts talking about billing and, and some other things. Uh, today is really going to be sort of a deep dive into the weeds here. So uh, certainly feel free to ask questions, put them in the Q&A box, uh, raise your hand. We will have some time for a sort of formal time set aside. But if there's something that's sort of relevant to what's going on while I'm talking, feel free to um, chime in and, and see if we can answer your question then. So it will sort of be a combination of, you know, if there's something that you want to address immediately that's really um, remain to what we're talking about that's great if it's more general we can save it to the end um, and I do hope that we can have sort of an interactive back and forth here I've got lots of materials I can certainly talk through all this but I would like to hear from you all and what you're interested in and what questions you may have um, so we're going to start off pretty basic here just so we all are on the same page here what is telehealth, telemedicine? We're not going to really get into the details of the differences between those for uh, today's talk. And in most of the world, you can use those terms interchangeably. I tend towards telehealth, but occasionally I will use the term telemedicine. <clears throat> CMS, you can see that the definition here has real uh, two-way real-time communication uh, through televideo equipment. One of the things you need to know for CMS that's important here is you can see um, they also want a video component to this. So this is where your billing comes in. Um, that CMS, if, if you want to bill them, you usually have to have a visual component, meaning a phone call doesn't count. Now that's changed a little bit here recently. We'll talk about that. But in general, CMS wants a visual component to the visit before it will uh, count as a billable telehealth or telemedicine visit. Um, the American Tele Telemedicine Association, ATA, which, by the way, is a great organization. I would encourage you, if you're looking for uh, resources, go there. There is a mental health um, subgroup that uh, has published some best practices on doing telemental health, as they call it. Uh, and basically, there's just lots of resources overall. So I, I, some of what you're hearing today is borrowed from them but uh, and sort of geared towards Indian country. But overall, they're a they're great resource there. So again, uh, you'll see talks a little bit about the differences between telehealth and telemedicine. And um, you know, they, they also include things like AI, virtual reality, and things like that uh, under telehealth. So it's a little bit broader umbrella than um, CMS CAST. I want to pause here. I should have put another slide. There's some terminology that can be quite confusing. I just want to try to clear up. Again, I apologize. It's not on the slide. But there, you will hear the originating site and the distant site. And I, quite frankly, I, I'm sort of embarrassed to say it took me like five or six years to sort of keep these straight in my head. It's not as straightforward as what I thought. Um, but now I think I finally got it. The originating site is where the patient is. 
So, and if we look at it, this comes from a billing perspective. So that's where the billing is originating from is where the patient is. The distant site is where the provider is. So if you dig into this literature at all, you will see it referred to as originating site in the distant site. Originating is where a patient is, distant site is where the provider is. We're gonna also just talk very briefly about the two kinds of broad kinds of telehealth. Um, asynchronous, what used to be called store and forward. This is for things like teledermatology, um, our national IHS tele-ophthalmology program. Generally, it is a service where you take a picture of something, it goes to a group of experts to read, to evaluate, to assess, and then they send the report back to you. So that's why it's asynchronous. You don't have to be online at the same time to do this. Um, there's some great advantages here. It doesn't require a lot of bandwidth. This is why this is a, a very useful and um, long-standing model in Alaska. Uh, you can take a picture in a, a native Alaska village, you can go through the satellite to uh, Anchorage and then back. Um, can be relatively fast turnaround. There are some cons here. You can't use it for everything. Um, for example, having a counseling session doesn't really work in this modality. You may have to have some special equipment and some special training. The tele-ophthalmology program that I mentioned that IHS has requires a special camera that's um, you know, quite large and you have to have someone trained on how to use it. And then the information usually has to be uploaded into the, your electronic health record. It may not occur automatically. So this is uh, asynchronous. Synchronous, or what used to be called sort of live telemedicine or telehealth, is what we're going to be talking about today. This is a real-time interaction just like this. Uh, you generally get to document directly into the electronic record. And of course, again, there's still less patient for the travel. Now, there's some downsides to this model as well, or this modality. Um, it requires some high bandwidth um, connections. So, in this session today, we're going to be talking for an hour-ish or so. And, you know, it's requiring everyone to have a pretty decent connection. And if you're doing patient care and I want to run even a higher quality image so I can see the patient better and they can see me better, it's going to require even higher bandwidth. So sometimes sites don't have that or they don't have it for long enough. The other thing about telebehavior health relative to, let's say, a, a check-in with a nurse um, for primary care via tele, our sessions generally are quite long, half an hour minimum, uh, up to an hour. That's a long time to have a, a sustained good internet connection, especially in Indian country. We'll talk about that a little bit, but that, that is one of the downsides for this type of modality. And again, you may have special equipment requirements. That's gotten to be less as um, time has gone on, uh, but still sometimes there are some special equipment that may be helpful. I want to talk a little bit about bandwidth, uh, again, just in the weeds a little bit here. The top picture, you can see if the X is your signal trying to get through, if you've got a narrow one lane traffic and you've got lots of stuff going on, your, your signal, this connection here, has to wait its turn to get through, to get through the traffic. So this can cause delays. It can cause the blockiness in the video, the, um, in the video, the audio getting choppy. Now look at the bottom, you can see if you've got a multiple lane highway, all the traffic can potentially fit through all at once. So your, your connection isn't waiting for anything. So that, that's one way of looking at it, is just the, the amount of bandwidth you have. More is always better, by the way. However, that's not always gonna be enough. You can have a multiple lane highway like at the bottom here, but if it is totally congested, think of like a, an LA freeway. Uh, if, if you've got six lanes, but every lane is bumper to bumper, your traffic still has to wait. So if people always wanna know what sort of connectivity, what sort of bandwidth do I need? It's hard to tell because what you actually need is what we call headroom. You need an empty lane to run your traffic through or a less a less full lane to run your traffic through. So you can have a huge connection, but if it's already taken up by other stuff, you can't sort of shove your, your um, connection through there very easily. By the same token, if you just have a single lane highway, but you're the only one on that highway, that's fine with us. The, you know, you're gonna be fine in your connection. So ultimately the amount of bandwidth you have is less important than that amount of headroom you have. How used is your bandwidth 
during the day. For example, what we often see when we go into a site is that it's not too bad, not too bad. Noon, what happens? Everyone gets on their computer for, you know, surfing, for Facebook, for watching YouTube. So it spikes and it shuts down our connection and we have trouble getting our piece through. So, uh, you know, those are the kinds of things you would want to evaluate and we get the chance we'll talk about how you can do some of those evaluations. And please let me know any questions, comments as we're going through this. So we're going to talk a little bit about platforms. This actually came up last time and it's a really good question. So what, what telehealth platform would I recommend? Uh, and as a federal employee, I can't recommend any specific platform. Um, we, we can't endorse any platform over the others. Um, what I can give you, though, are some things to look for in your platform. And I'm saying platform here because uh, nowadays we've moved away from having standalone telehealth equipment overall. When I got into this 12-ish years ago, we had the big polycom units that many of you may have seen with the camera on top and, you know, they're about this wide. Um, they tended to run about 15 to 20,000 at that time. Those units are great. It's great to have a camera on top that's remote controlled, but nowadays we can do it with a laptop, a, a, an external webcam like this, and a second monitor. We can, we can stand up a site for about 150 bucks is what we tell folks. And that's the platform. If you've got a good telehealth platform, it can ride on almost any sort of equipment that you have. So the specialized equipment can still be used, but it's not a requirement like it was say eight years ago or so. So when you're looking at your platform, what do you want? I think the number one thing, and certainly people can argue with how these, the rankings here, is ease of use. If it's not easy to use, your providers won't use it, your patients won't use it. We've seen this as COVID has hit and, and we've seen people start using other platforms, they, they veer um, towards those ones that are very easy to use. Um, the ones they're familiar with, uh, FaceTime, for example, um, Zoom, for example, things that if people are already used to using it in their private lives, it's very easy to pivot and do that for tele. Um, so you want to make sure it's something easy to use, otherwise it won't get used. You also want to think about privacy, and we're going to get into this a little bit more in a slide or two. How secure is it? Is it something that you can really trust? Uh, is it HIPAA compliant? Right now, that's not an issue, but oh, in about four weeks, it's going to be again, potentially. So. Um, Something to keep in your mind is that privacy issue. And then lastly, and again, I'm not, this is no, by no means the least of these, but how does it work in a low bandwidth environment? In Indian country, what we have seen is this huge digital divide. You've probably heard the term kicked around. It's just this idea that there are parts of the country and certain populations that don't have access to the same uh, broadband that other uh, regions and other populations may have. And so what we found is in Indian country, this is really a struggle for us. I quite frankly was shocked. Has COVID hit and we started pivoted to tr pivot, pivoting to go into people's homes to provide care, telebehavioral health care into their homes. It's been a real challenge for us. Uh, what we find is that many patients don't have good connections in their home. Um, even mobile connections, let alone a wired or Wi-Fi connection in their home. Um, We've also found that some of the phones that folks are using maybe aren't even modern enough to really support the kind of long, uh, long form televideo streaming that we need them to have. So the digital divide is certainly a real thing and the Indian country is generally lagging behind the rest of the country as far as connectivity goes. So you want to make sure that it can work or can work as good as possible in these low bandwidth environments. And as I said before, specialized equipment may not be a thing that you need any longer. So I alluded to this idea that things have changed with COVID and they certainly have. The federal government has really stepped up and tried to make telehealth more user-friendly and more available under the, pub, uh, the uh, public health emergency declarations. So these are just some summaries of things that hit telehealth overall that you should be aware of. So same state li licensure is no bad. longer required. I'm sorry? Is there a question? Okay. Please chime in if there's a question or stop me and I'll be happy to uh, 
to address it. Uh, same state licensures are no longer required. For tribal and programs and IHS programs, this has never been an issue, has not been an issue for a long time. Uh, for our urban partners, this has been an issue, and for private sector, this has been an issue. But basically, you don't have to have a license in the state where the patient resides. So that really makes it much, much easier to provide care, especially in larger regions. Uh, HIPAA requirements have been relaxed regarding televideo platforms. Previous slide, I said it needs to be private and secure. Right now, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, the folks uh, who regulate HIPAA or enforce HIPAA have said, look, as long as you're acting what they call in good faith, we're not going to enforce HIPAA requirements. So that means you can use things like FaceTime, Facebook Messenger, Google Hangouts, Zoom, um, almost any other platform you can think of, you can use it for patient care now. Now, one of the things I, I will step back and make a little bit of a differentiation here, broadcast platforms you cannot use for telehealth. Think of things like Twitch, where it's kind of like a TV station where one person is there, the streaming services where one person is there and multiple people watch, not okay. And it make, that makes sense. But platforms where you can connect one-to-one -one or have two or three folks connecting in, those are fine for now. So just be aware that you can use those for the moment. Also, CMS, I, I said CMS wants a, a video component with their visits before you can bill them. They've relaxed that a little bit. There are virtual check-ins where telephone contacts can be billed in certain instances. You'll need to talk to your state folks about this and your, um, your billers and coders about this, but CMS has relaxed some of the requirements for that um, video component. And then lastly, the four wall four walls rule, basically saying care needs to take place in a care facility, again, have been relaxed, and now in-home services can be reimbursed. That is great for us as many of our patients are uh, staying home, many of our facilities are limiting access to them, so you can actually provide care in that person's home and get reimbursed for that. So all these things have been stood up to help telehealth expand, and it has expanded greatly. Within IHS, we are about ninefold where we were as far as the number of visits um, pre-COVID versus where we are now. So it's, it's a huge difference for us. Um, I've heard from other folks in HHS that it's, in some instances, a thousandfold increase. So um, telehealth is really taking off. Now, given all these, there's a word of caution here. Right now, these are all set to expire, I believe, on October 24th. So that is about um, four weeks. Actually, it is four weeks from today, <laughs> roughly a month from today. So if you're using a platform that is not HIPAA compliant, you may need to find a new platform on October 24th. We don't really know right now what's going to happen. Um, if they're gonna leave some of these in place, I know CMS is looking at s these two things in particular about are they gonna leave them in place or are they gonna modify them? I, I'm not sure what's going on with HIPAA, but I, I think people are really sort of holding their breath to see there's a, a sense from folks that telehealth, telebehavior health included, is going to be greatly expanded even after this declaration goes away. But I think the level what level it ends up sort of evening out on is going to be, de be dependent on these issues. Uh, how loose are the regulations going to be relative to what they were before? Or do they go back to exactly what it was before? Uh, I can tell you that getting a televideo platform that's HIPAA compliant is not cheap. Um, and it, it, there's, there are challenges around that. They're maybe not as user-friendly as some of the other platforms. So you know, billing and coding and sustainability may be impacted as well. So keep that in the back of your mind. You've got another month of these things being in place and then it's not clear how things are going to play out. So uh, this is, I'm not gonna go through this. This is just uh, sort of in the weeds summary of some of these changes, the virtual check-ins, the e-visits, those kinds of things. These are all put in there for your information whenever you get to the slides or uh, you can download the slides and go through them yourselves. Um, so equipment here, all right, let me see. All right, I do see a question. Let me jump, let me take a look at these and see if there's something I'm going to come back to or um, do now. So uh, how does it impact tribal counseling? Um, 
All right, and I think we can answer that. So as far as uh, impact tribal schools and counseling, you know, it really depends on the entity you're working with. Some, if it, so a tribal school, that tribe may have products or solutions that they prefer or that they find more secure. Um, we come across this on a regular basis in working with our tribal partners is that um, we have a platform that we have to use as IHS and a federal entity, but maybe their firewall is not set up correctly. So it may take some additional troubleshooting for us to be able to get through uh, their firewall and actually uh, connect in the way that we need to. We can go through, we potentially we'll go through this later on and talk about how sort of the layers of testing and things that you go through to ensure that you're going to have a good connection before you go live. Um, so overall, I would say I, I don't know that this is impacted in any significant way it, as far as the processes go. I can tell you we're looking to deploy in a new school, in a, a new deployment in an existing BIE school, and um, we're following our same processes, and they're, they're doing fine. So I don't, I don't see this necessarily having a significant impact in that sort of setting. Suggesting for those using internet and reside in multi-generational household with school-aged children that are also attending school virtually. For example, there are some, some family members stop using video during work meetings and audio. Um, yeah, hi, Christy. That is a tough one. Um, so, yes, we sometimes we have had people say, look, here, I, I need to meet with my doctor and they're gonna call in and we're gonna meet from the house. So the rest of you, you gotta turn off Netflix, you gotta turn off YouTube. You've got to just, um, I need the bandwidth right now. And sometimes you have to do that. Uh, and I think that that's fine. It, it's a time limited thing. So I think that that is something that, uh, is this some, maybe something that you have to do depending on your connection. Uh, let me throw in another issue here, though, that people, I think, don't talk about a lot. If you're writing, if you're at home and doing, getting, receiving telehealth services, many um, uh, internet service providers have data caps. And if you go over them, they charge you more. So are you going to go over your data cap because you're participating in telehealth? If you're on your mobile uh, connection, Lots of cellular providers provide uh, enforced data caps or start throttling the connection after a certain point. And we've seen this, you know, the connection will be going fine and we're 30 minutes into an hour long session and then the signal gets degraded and the session becomes much harder uh, to pull off. So be aware that receiving telehealth services at home could actually end up with an additional cost for you on either your internet bill or your mobile bill. As a matter of fact, one of the things that we have now whenever we talk to, whenever we meet patients in the home is a disclosure saying, you understand, do you understand that this may result in a higher phone bill? And do you want to proceed? We, we make sure the patients are aware that upfront is sort of a, a consent uh, in addition to our regular consent about this could cost you more and is that okay? And if not, then we will revert to a voice only call or do something else. Um, but just be aware that those things are um, potentially problematic. The last thing I will say about this is it's not only an individual home. We actually had this. I've heard of communities where each house has their own connection, but there's one pipe that leads to the community. So the example I got was when everyone gets home at six o'clock or five o'clock or whatever, no one can stream anything. It's all because everyone's on it at the same time. So it's not even if all the kids in the house turned off their devices you still can't get a good connection because it's the community that's being starved for bandwidth, not your home. So um, that could be another issue as well. So it's quite complicated, unfortunately. Yes, I, uh, so yes, my understanding is the slides will be made available. And I, I will try to not rush through. There's a lot of stuff though, and it, like I say, we're in the weeds and I'll be happy to come back and answer questions or certainly send me an email. Uh, I'll be happy to talk to you. So when we talk about equipment and platforms, I want to go through this as sort of an order of preference here. And on the left, you see the provider. On the right, you see the patient. So provider, it's really nice for your provider to have a standalone televideo unit. Um, the new ones now that we're getting, they run, I think, 2,500 
dollars, maybe something like that. But it's really a nice setup. It's got a nice camera. It is separate from your computer, so you don't you're not reliant on the computer to be doing your electronic health record and the televideo session. Your touch screen basically there's a button that says start. They hit it and it goes. It's very high quality, uh, much higher quality than a computer monitor, so they can get a really clear picture. Um, so ideally, a standalone televideo unit would be nice. These are desk based, by the way. You can still get the big old units if you want them, but those are kind of overkill. If you don't do that, then your provider does need a computer and a high definition webcam. I, I will tell you that the webcams built into most laptops aren't so great. And you can see that if you've done video connections with your family. The standalone camera I have here and that we recommend is much, much better, especially in low light settings and be able to adjust for different lighting. Um, standalone camera is great. They will run you anywhere from say 50 to 100 bucks. One word of caution, since COVID hit, it's hard finding one. <laughs> Literally they've sold out and they're not in stock as nearly as much as they used to be before. So that may be the only issue with that. So if you don't have any of that available in your provider, then you can use a tablet. You can use an iPad, for example, and that's okay. Uh, not great. And then lastly, if you're just in a pinch, say, hey, patient really needs to see me now. They're really struggling. You can do it th with your cell phone. Not ideal again. It's not how you want to have every session, but it is something that will allow you to connect with patients even if you're not in your office, for example. Um, so these are sort of the ranked order of the kinds of stuff we would like the provider to have. Now on the patient side, you'll see it's pretty similar, except their number one recommendation is a computer and a high definition webcam. If they can have that, that's great. Um, that would be awesome. If they don't have a high definition cam, the one built into the laptop will work, certainly. And I would say that that's better than a tablet. There probably should be another bullet point here. Uh, the laptop with the built in webcam should be second. Then of course, like we said, a tablet and then mobile device. Uh, we don't recommend standalone units for um, in-home visits with patients due to the cost, due to potential for being damaged in the home. Um, it's just, there are other ways of dealing with it that I think are more efficient and cost effective. So that's kind of our equipment recommendations if you're looking at sort of the stuff you need, the nuts and bolts you need to run a session. We're going to talk a little bit, we, I know we talked a little bit about connectivity and broadband, but we're going to talk about it in a little more detail here. This is always our preferred connection here. Wired is always best. So if, um, we basically, our providers, we tell them your computer needs to be plugged in. This is again also why a computer and standalone televideo unit comes ahead of a tablet and a phone because those things at best run on Wi-Fi or worse run on mobile connections. Wired connection is always your most stable connection. So um, wired connection first, wireless or Wi-Fi second, and then lastly your mobile connection. I said earlier that it's hard to give a broadband recommendation. We do take a stab at it here. So um, there's no maximum, more is always better. Minimum, you want one uh, megabit per second uh, down. So, and for mobile, we've done lots of testing on mobile and we can do actually 4G and do a full-blown televideo connection that's good quality. You want at least two bars on a 4G. If you're on 3G, we, we tried it and we just really could not get it to work, not with the video component. So you're looking at 4G minimum. Um, for that and a couple of bars on that. So this is just some guidelines of what you'd be looking for to do televideo, um, telehealth connections. Oh, sorry about that. And you know, the other piece you need to be aware of is there's no guarantees here. Things are extraordinarily variable when it comes to connections. We could have a whole, we could spend a whole day talking about this. In terms you may be here around network connections, there's hops, how many how many stops does that signal take before it gets to where it needs to be? That's a big deal and it's something that you don't really see a lot. So um, we have a site that's about 125 miles from Albuquerque where I'm located. And to get here, it's 200 hops and 1200 miles. It's nuts. It goes literally around the country to get here. 
because that's how it's routed. So telehealth with them is quite challenging, despite it being relatively close, and they have a really high connection. Uh, they've got like, uh, I don't know, half a gig connection. It's amazing, but we still can't do it. Latency is another thing you will see, sort of the delay. This comes in when we start talking about satellite connections. Uh, these are pretty prominent in Alaska, for example. We can't do real-time televideo over, over those connections. The, the time it takes to leave my computer, go up to space, go back down to their computer is, is too much. We get out of sync and the software can't handle it. Some of the new connections like uh, the Starlink coming from Elon Musk's shop, those things may be better at that, but right now the satellite connections don't really work that well for us for real time. And then hardware, even if you have a computer, uh, there may be other things that are slowing it down or maybe so old that it really doesn't work well. Long story short, test it, test it a lot before you jump in and just say, we're gonna make this work um, because there are lots of variables here. So let's talk a little bit about staffing. How, how, do you, how are you gonna staff your telehealth program if this is something you really want to do? If you're standing up and having providers, this is if you're having the providers in your own shop, your own program. If you're using existing staff, you're probably going to be okay. If you're bringing on new staff, just be aware that just because they're tele doesn't mean that they, are, they have any sort of special way of getting into your system. Uh, on our side, we have to do a full background check on them still. Uh, they still have to go through the full credentialing and privileging process. And they have to get access to electronic health record outside of your care system. So one of the things that we didn't really think about too much whenever we first started, when I first started this, but you know, you document care, you sit down at the computer inside the hospital and you type it in. How do I do that if I'm not in the hospital? For us, it's, it's, it's been quite a lengthy process. At one point, it was 25 steps to get a provider from their home computer logged into the patient's electronic health record. Um, it's gotten a little bit shorter now, but it's still something that you need to be thinking of is how does that care get documented um, in your own system? Are there ways to allow people from outside of your system to get in there? Um, and oftentimes it's purposely difficult because it's a security risk, right? You just don't want anyone to be able to come in and access it. So um, there are lots of uh, vetting and barriers that are put up to get that access. So just be aware that if you're using telehealth services and you're wanting to uh, credential a telehealth staff, someone to do telehealth within your system, you're going to follow the same kinds of rules that you have for in-person. There's no shortcuts, I guess, is the point here. When you're doing telehealth, and I talked about this a little bit last time, you actually need a couple of different backup plans. Just like as if you were in-person, you need a backup plan for clinical or patient issues, but you also need a backup plan for technology issues. So it's a little more complicated here. And this is going to seem like I'm veering off the road here, but this comes into play with your backup plans here. Your telehealth program, if you're the originating site, really hinges on your telehealth coordinator. This is someone that we require every site have identified. It's not generally a full-time job. We just need someone that is there when the clinic is active. This person, um, you can see what they would do. They would potentially they would go turn on the equipment. That, we can't do that from a thousand miles away. They would walk the patient into the room. They would make sure the microphone was unmuted. All these types of things that we can't do and that we don't want to require the patient to do. The, these are the clinic facilitators or coordinators. They make that clinic work. Our provider can be online and ready to go, but unless their coordinator where that patient is at the originating site does their job, we can't provide care. So. Our, our program and your telehealth program will live and die on someone doing this job well. So keep that in mind. This is, we can't stress this, and people when we first started didn't really get this, that this is really the key, the linchpin to it all. A good telehealth coordinator makes your clinic amazing and your patients love it and love you and love the provider and the provider loves you. And the sites where we struggle, we've had sites where we've been in there for 10 years and we still struggle because they don't have a good coordinator or they rotate who the coordinator is and no one's ever sort of all on the same page. It doesn't have to be a clinical person. We have coordinators who are secretaries, who are nurses, who are admin assistants. 
we need someone that's reliable and organized. And you can see the other things. The, this ties into the emergency plan, as you can see here, that these people are always available during the clinic. They don't have other duties as assigned during the clinic. This is all they're doing, even if it means they're just sitting there waiting. Because if there's an emergency, the patient says, I'm going to go hurt myself, gets up and storms out of the room, the provider a thousand miles away cannot impact that. They cannot do anything to stop that patient or to talk them down once they leave the room. That's where your emergency plan is often call the telehealth coordinator. They activate the emergency plan at the originating site. So it's sort of this, this trickle down or step down process with the telehealth coordinator often being the key contact there. It's a bonus, by the way, if it's a community member, this can be amazing. We have community members and our providers love it because they start the session, uh, they start up the equipment, the telehealth coordinators there, and they get all of the community news, gossip, rumors, and it really helps them understand the context of where they are. Again, being a thousand miles away or more, it can be very challenging providing care and feel connected to that community. But if you've got a coordinator who's from the community and they're willing, again, not to gossip in any sort of malicious way, but to just educate the provider as to what's going on. Oh, it's feast day that's coming up. Or, oh, this thing happened with the tribal council. You may hear about this or that. It's, that's invaluable to um, our providers. So that is a bonus if your coordinator is from the community and is willing to share some of that information. We also, as, as we've pivoted in going into in-home, that gets really challenging. How do you have emergency plan if the patient is not in your facility and you don't have a telehealth coordinator? It's very tricky. Fortunately, the VA has been doing this for about three years now. And so what you're seeing here is really adopted from the VA's uh, template and protocols. So this is what we've been doing as we've pivoted to in-home telebehavioral health services. Um, we ask the providers to collect this every time. It's a pain. It, they don't like it. The patients don't like it. But we really want it done every time. Where are they, where are they calling in from? What's the session? Are they at home? Are they at a relative's house? Are they in a hotel? Are they traveling? We need that information every time. Redundant, but yeah, we want your phone number again. Who is the name of someone outside the home or in the home other than you that we can call if something goes wrong? And as a behavioral health provider, what, what we jump to is, oh, what if the patient's going to hurt someone? What if they pick up a knife? What if they, you know, all these other things. In three years, the VA's never had that happen in hundreds of thousands of visits, by the way. What they have had happen, mental of a telepsychiatry appointment, the person has a heart attack. They can't communicate anymore. They've collapsed. They gave the name a number for their neighbor who got called immediately, ran over and helped intervene while 911 was called and got them there. So I know as behavioral health, we often go to sort of the behavioral health crises, but there are other things that can happen that we, the, the reasons why we would need this information. And then for us in Indian country, you all know this, it's very complicated at times who you should call. Is it tribal police? Is it state? Is it federal? Is it county? Uh, here in New Mexico, we have an area called the checkerboard area in Western uh, New Mexico. Literally every mile, square mile, every section line, Jurisdiction varies. That's why it's called the checkerboard. You never know who to call. So we, our default is we just ask the patient. So who would you call if there was an emergency? And that's sort of where we would start the process if we needed to notify emergency services. It's not great, but that's sort of the best we can do because we don't have a good way, especially if, again, we're a thousand miles away. We will rely on the patient to figure out who to call for these in-home visits. So in-home, challenging. Uh, no doubt about it, but you can take, have ways of protecting yourself and, and protecting the patient. Questions, comments? Okay. Um, so other considerations if you're doing in-home, which again, what we have seen for many IHS and tribal facilities is a hard pivot to in-home. Um, most facilities don't want behavioral health patients coming in and either exposing others or being exposed to COVID. So 
we've seen many behavioral clinics shut down for in-person services and pivot to in-home. So that's why this all came about. Um, did they provide the verbal consent? We get questions all the time, well, how do we get consent? Verbal consent, if documented by the provider in the provider's note, is generally considered fine. Um, I think most accrediting bodies will accept that. Um, we do have some sites who actually have partnered and bought third-party tools where um, they can actually email a link to the patient and the patient would sign it electronically. That's great. I, I, I hope we all get there one day. That is something that most sites either don't have the ability to do, they can't afford to do, or don't have the knowledge on how to do it. Those tools are out there. I suspect they'll come more prevalent. Um, but for now, we just document that there's verbal consent given by the patient. Um, oh, by the way, this is not in there. I'm sorry, this should not have been left out. Don't record the session. It, 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 whole can of worms. It is, you just don't even want to go there. So just be aware that um, recording the session, while it may seem like a good idea for many reasons, it, it is a legal HIPAA nightmare. So please don't do that. Oh, and by the way, we have had providers say, well, my patient recorded the session. That's a lot trickier. So do they have the right to record it? Do they not? And, and I don't have an answer here. I can tell you what a lawyer said is that those laws vary from state to state on whether you need consent to record someone without their knowledge. Um, my stance on this as a provider is that's a discussion. If you think your patient is recording or says they have recorded, that's a discussion for therapy. Why? Maybe there's a good reason. Maybe they don't feel like they can remember everything, so they want to record it. Maybe they want to show someone else in the family because they think it'll be helpful. Maybe they want to show, you know, a caregiver so that they can be on the same page. There are legitimate reasons to record. I, I want to put that out there. Um, on the other hand, maybe it's not. Maybe they want to try to catch you doing something or maybe they want to use it in some other way that's not appropriate. So um, it is a topic for discussion, in my opinion, if the patient is recording the session and you, you hear about that or you have knowledge of that. Um, other considerations here. Did they acknowledge that it could increase their cost for a cellular bill or their, um, their internet um, bill? I just need to acknowledge it. It's, again, I, you could potentially document that. And also, this is another thing people worry about, and we have had issues here, setting up the expectations that it is the same for an in-person session. They need to be dressed appropriately, not laying in bed in their pajamas. They need to set boundaries. The TV needs to be off. Music needs to be off. They need to be able to focus. So if they wouldn't wear it into the office, they shouldn't be wearing it there. If they're uh, on their phone, again, that's not something they'd probably be doing in your private office. So I would set up, make sure you set up the expectations with them is, yes, we're doing this in a different setting. And yes, I know it feels more comfortable and different potentially, but I really need you to follow the same rules. Um, we've had people who call into their sessions while driving. That's a hard no, by the way. <laughs> Our provider's like, no, I am not going to see you. I'm not even going to do a, an audio phone session with you while you are driving. So I think some education has to be done here. Um, the sooner you can do it, the better. I think it's one of the things our system is struggling with is trying to communicate those expectations clearly, um, but they need to be put out there. Did I see a question pop up? Let me see, um, slide, all right, from Micah, thank you, Micah. When uh, doing telehealth, tele services across state lines, how do we navigate the age of medical consent? Um, yep, you're in Oregon and you support the boarding school and you have people all around. Um, that is a huge can of worms. It is very challenging. Um, we generally try to follow the rules where the patient is. That's really where, that's, that's what should happen. Having said that, as you point out, Micah, it is extraordinarily difficult to find out what age of consent is for patients. And um, I, 
I suggest you make a good faith effort and do your best. Um, but it, it, it is very challenging with youth. And I can also tell you when we talk about in-home services like this, we've had issues where the teen has said, I don't want my parents to know. I don't want them to hear me. And I know they're listening at the door. So sometimes the teens don't want to have an in-home session because they don't feel like it's private or confidential. And not just teens, by the way, this can happen with other adults as well. If there's lots of people in the homes, um, housing on many, in many tribal communities is a huge problem as far as overcrowding goes. So it's not uncommon to have multiple, you know, generations and people in the house. We've literally had patients shut themselves in the closet to have a session because they didn't feel like <clears throat> there was any other place that's private. Hold on just a second. <clears throat> so a couple of things here to unpack. If the teen doesn't feel like that he or she can have a private visit, they may have to go somewhere else if they give, if they give consent or if they age to give consent, maybe a friend's house. Maybe they could do that. Um, if the patient, adult or teen, doesn't feel like it's private, one of the things that we often tell people is a car is actually a pretty good private secure office. Go sit in the car. Shut the doors. If you get a signal, that's always the issue. We actually do have patients who will drive here in New Mexico to the top of the mesa because they know they can get a really good cell signal and it's going to be private. No one's going to be around and that's where they do their session. Um, we've had patients who sit in the McDonald's parking lot in their car because they can get free Wi-Fi at McDonald's. I don't know how McDonald's feels about that, but if it gets them their care, then, um, you know, maybe that will work. Sometimes community uh, libraries have free Wi-Fi or the chapter house. So, you know, if they could drive up there. Um, the bottom line is, Micah, that's a really good point. It's very challenging. I don't, I don't have a clear answer other than, trying to follow the law where the patient is. I, I think that is your safest uh, bet. I would also say, you know, consult if you're in IHS with the OGC and, and talk to them about it, but it, it is very challenging. The other piece that the take home here is sometimes you have to be creative and your patients have to be creative on getting them the care that they need, whether it's being in the car, being in a different room, going to a friend's house, going um, to ride Wi-Fi on someone else, somewhere else. It's um, it's not easy. Thanks for the questions, by the way. So I'm gonna lay out four scenarios here and sort of increasing order of difficulty. And so these, for us, these are the four scenarios that we come across in telebehavior health. Pre-COVID, all we did was number one, the, the clinic to clinic. That was our model. And you'll see why here in a minute. Uh, we did some of um, the home to clinic. At the, and again, and you'll see this as we go through this. I apologize, this slide is not very clear. Think of the left side as being the provider and the right side being the patient. So provider at home, patient in clinic, um, provider in clinic, patient at home, and then both of them at home. So clinic to clinic is going to be your easiest way to do this. It's the most controlled environment. You have control over each end. You know, they're in a, an IHS facility here and an IHS facility here, or they're in a tribal facility here and a tribal facility here. Uh, many of our tribal partners have satellite clinics. And so they have their main clinic and they're seeing the patient in the satellite clinic so they don't have to drive. Great. You're going to be able to control the network and have, look, monitor the network connectivity. Uh, you're going to have easy access to the HR. You don't have to worry about it because you're already in the clinic setting. Your backup plans are probably already in place here. Um, it's just like you were in person, basically. Um, those things are um, there. And you have easy access to IT support. This is something I've not really talked about. This is a huge deal, by and large, um, that, that is something that's easy to overlook. But if you can grab the IT person from down the hall and say, hey, we're not connecting, that's huge. If you're at home, you're kind of your own IT support. My shop does a little bit of this, but it is, it's hard. And so um, if you want to get into telehealth, and certainly if you wanted your telebehavior health specifically before COVID, this was the model I would suggest. I still think that we could get back to a model like this, 
um, this is certainly the easiest for these reasons. So your next easiest, if you got the provider at home in a home office, or now I will just say not even home, outside of the clinic, um, they're not inside your healthcare system, how are they getting in? And so we do have a provider who's worked from his home office for the past seven years. So we've kind of gotten pretty good at this, but there are still challenges. Um, you'll see the first thing is you don't have a lot of control of your provider's internet connection. As a matter of fact, seven years in, our provider's internet service provider um, had an issue and they couldn't sort it out. So he lives in Gallup, but he's in Albuquerque for this ex next month providing care because he can't get a good connection in his home in Gallup. So there are challenges here that um, can be problematic. Uh, EHR access may be challenging. How are you getting into it? We already talked about this. I'm not really going to go through it. Within IHS, we use the virtual private network. That is a pretty common way of getting into electronic health records, um, but it requires a whole other layer of connections and paperwork and points of failure. So it's a challenge. IT support is going to be uh, remote at best and lacking and completely at worst. Home office setup, what does it look like? Something to keep in mind if you're doing, if you're working from home as a provider, what's behind you? I, maybe this stuff is okay. I, I, I don't know. I don't do telebehavior health from here. One of the th couple of things I, I just tell people to consider, what do you want the people to see? What do you want your patients to see behind you? Are there pictures of your family? Is that okay? Are there pictures of your dog? I, I don't know. Are there posters that are inappropriate? You know, these kinds of things you need to consider. Um, lighting is a big deal. I can tell you, I see people all the time where a window is behind them. And if you've ever seen this on any of your video connections, basically the person's in shadow the whole time. You can't even see their face sometimes. So think about it. you want the lighting from front or above, not from behind. It's going to totally, uh, the exposure on the camera just won't be able to deal with it. This is where, again, the practicing and the connections and the testing comes in here. And um, lastly, a little trick I learned very early on, if you're going to be doing um, services from home, patients really appreciate if you have a clock behind you. This is for them, not for you. They can see how much longer they have in their session. So a clock with big numbers or a big face, very helpful for the patients. It's a simple little tip. But it goes a long way into helping um, patients to stay on track and they can see how much uh, longer they have in the session. Lastly, prescribing and controlled substances. We're not going to get into this a lot, but I, what I will say is that controlled substances require what's called a wet signature, meaning that um, it can't just be signed and faxed. Um, it can't be done electronically unless certain other things are met. Um, so oftentimes it, it could mean that you actually are literally handwriting a prescription and overnighting it to the site. That's how we've had to do it for some sites. Um, IHS now has a way of prescribing controlled substances electronically, which is great. That really um, changes our provider's workflow and makes it so much easier your system may or may not have that. So controlled substances are an issue that you will need to deal with if you hiring a prescriber to do telehealth for you. Um, and be aware that controlled substances are used quite a lot in behavioral health. ADHD medications, anti-anxiety medications, pain medications, all controlled substances by and large. So um, this will come up potentially. So, um, the providers in the clinic and the patients at home. We are doing some of this now. It's very similar to the other, except it's reversed now. Now the patient's at home. We don't have any control over the patient's connection. Uh, we also don't have control over the therapy environment now. I've touched on some of this. TV, phone, music, pets. Um, are there other people around? So is, is it a confidential visit now? Is someone listening outside the door? Someone else in the room? You know, those are all things that you need to consider and the patient needs to consider and talk to them about it. Um, make sure that they understand their rights to confidentiality. And if they don't want to say something or if they don't want to continue with the visit, that's okay. Uh, and let them know that. Um, now, I will say one of the things that I find very interesting about 
patients being at home and us reaching into their homes. When I was practicing out in the field, I did literal home visits. And it was amazing to see how patients lived and what the layout of their house and how chaotic it was, how clean it was, all these kinds of things. Tons of value added as a therapist and as a provider. You can kind of get a sense of that with these kinds of visits as well. Not quite to the degree, but similar. They are literally inviting you into their home, even if it is electronically. So I think it's a, it's a higher level of trust that's conveyed. And um, it can provide lots of other details. So I think there are some good things about reaching into patients' homes uh, when invited and when done appropriately. I mentioned this, setting up the expectations. Setting up um, the emergency plan, it's a pain every time. We need that information every time. And then realize that they may have very limited IT support. Uh, what we have found is that sometimes parents or older um, folks, they have their teen or their kid come in and set up or troubleshoot for them. You know, you do what you can to deliver care. Sometimes that may happen. And lastly here, as far as our scenarios go, home to home. This is your most challenging. You don't have control over either end um, or the environment. Um, but the same things kind of apply here. You're going to set up the expectations. You're going to have an emergency plan that's reviewed. You need to have a really good contingent um, emergency plan for technology because it could fail at either end now more easily and not have the support. So, um, you need to have that discussion with the patient. All right, if we lose connection, I'm going to call you or you call me. Um, and as much as I know people would like to do this, texting isn't really okay. Um, it's not within IHS. We're not considered that as a secure way of communicating with patients. Um, so it is kind of challenging what you can do unless you have a secure messaging system. Same with email. So just be aware that it, it gets tricky here and that you just need to have a lot more discussion and communication with the patients around this type of care that you're doing. And the other piece of this I will say is that by and large, our patients have been extraordinarily understanding. Um, as we've tried to roll out in-home services and it fails or doesn't work the way that we want it to, Many patients, well, I haven't heard any complaints, and not that I would have heard all of them, but many patients just appreciate the effort. They appreciate that they don't have to drive. They appreciate that they can get care without being exposed uh, potentially to COVID or other things. So um, despite the challenges we have found, we've gotten lots of positive feedback about it. Questions, comments, please um, jump in here. So... I want to talk a little bit about this. You, you may be aware of this, but if not, I'll throw this out there. This is a, an article that I was a co-author on with a um, health economist from the University of Mexico. You can click this link and, and find the article here. We wanted to see if telebehavior health in rural native populations was worth it. And this is specific to New Mexico, um, but I think it's pretty applicable sort of in a broader context. So the cost, um, and the way we did it is for 30 minute session with a psychiatrist, what is the cost? So if we send, if the site sends a patient to the psychiatrist on average, this is what that 30 minute session would cost for the site. By the way, this is site cost, not patient cost. If we brought the provider to the patient, we see a lot of savings here, right? So there's, there's, there's some economies of scale there because we're going to say to the provider, um, okay, let's, let's take, for example, Muscalero, New Mexico, three and a half hours from New, Mexi from New Mexico, from Albuquerque. So provider has to drive for seven hours, provide eight hours of care, and this is what it's going to cost you. Not too bad. But if we want to do telebehavior health, you can see our costs go down significantly again. So um, long-winded way of saying is that telebehavior health is, for your system, a cost-effective way to deliver care. I would argue the most cost-effective way of delivering care, unless you have a provider that's close and can be in person. Clearly, if you've got someone that lives in the community and comes in to, the, to work every day, that's a different model that, that is, works well. I can tell you 
the vast majority of sites we are in is because they can't get that kind of care in person. We're the only game in town for either specialty care or just care in general. So um, just you should just be aware of these numbers. And again, you can download the article here and take a look at it. It was a fun little article and it really confirmed what we thought. So the other side of things, and I, I think this is, I don't know, this is to me is more important. So let's talk about what we save our patients by doing telebehavioral health. This is for just my center. Um, there are more telebehavioral programs in Indian country and in IHS. But if we just looked at, and these for, were for FY 2018. So it's a, we're a little bit older here on these numbers, but you'll get the, the picture here. So we estimated, we, average, we saved patients over a million and a half miles of driving. Significant, uh, very significant. You can look at environmental costs, right? They didn't uh, put that much carbon. Wear and tear on cars. The other thing that I think is something to keep in mind here in New Mexico, and we're also in many of the northern tier states, in winter, it's very challenging to maybe get to your site and quite dangerous. So if we keep people off the roads, um, potentially increased um, avoided healthcare costs and uh, healthier, safer patients. If we run the numbers here, and this is a lowball estimate, this is just using the IRS reimbursement number here, we save patients um, almost $900,000 in costs uh, of travel costs. Considering that we treat the most impoverished population in this country, I think that's significant. That's money patients keep in their pockets. That's really, really important, I think, to many of our patients and many of our communities. Equally important, um, 24,000 hours of work and or school not missed. We know many of our patients work jobs where they don't get sick leave. Uh, so if they don't go to work, if they have to take off work and drive seven hours for a 30 minute appointment, that's, that's a paycheck miss. That's a, a big, that's a whole day of a paycheck miss out of your paycheck gone. Um, and what we find is people just wouldn't go for care, right? I mean, that's a hard sell. Yeah, you miss a day of work, you pull your kid out of school, who's struggling in school, by the way, and needs to be there and for a 30 minute med follow up. That's, that's a really hard sell. So I, I telehealth helps, telebehavior health helps you avoid that. So again, I just put that out there. I think this is a really important thing to keep in mind. So that is the end of this. We've got some other things to talk about if we want. Um, at the end of this slide deck, and here's my, my um, contact info, um, our website, go there. There's a bunch of resources there. Um, you can reach out to us. We have a toolkit, and if I have time, I'll share that with you. We're currently in the middle of a revision of the toolkit, a telebehavioral health toolkit, um, but it really does lay out a lot of what I talked about, but even in more detail. Basically, if you can check every box in this toolkit, you know you're ready to go, and again, we may talk about that a little bit today if we have time. The other thing, and I'm not going to go through these, but if you scroll on down, here's just resources that... Um, talk about some of the waivers that are in place, the, how the, the things around HIPAA, and you can see where they say you can use FaceTime or Skype during the public health emergency. These are some of the other things. So, um, so that, that is, those are my slides. And again, those resources are just there for you to look at later. Questions, comments, concerns. I know it's a lot to absorb. Nothing? All right. Thanks, Paula. I'm going to, I'm gonna stop this and I'm going to try to share then, um, the toolkit, just so you have some sense of. Um... While you're pulling that up, Dr. Four, I just wanted uh -huh. to tell you, thank you for a fantastic presentation. I've been doing telehealth for 20 years, and that was a great presentation. It really dug into the details and all of the things that you have to think about when you're providing telehealth services. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. I appreciate that. I always love hearing from folks that are doing it and that they've um, 
learn something new. I know when I attend something like this, I, um, I often, you know, I have the opportunity to learn something new and to learn from the folks I'm presenting to. So absolutely I appreciate that. Can you all see on um, the PDF that I have? We can, yes. Okay, great. Great. Um, so, and again, chime in if, um, you would like to folks I'm going to so this is our toolkit it's under revision we hope to have the revision done soon um, but I, I'm going to hit a few things in here that perhaps I, I didn't hit this just sort of lays out the case for for telebehavioral health but this is how it works you know you go through what it is um, we talked about that to even take a step back from what I just talked about what what are your needs what you know people say well we want telehealth my question to them is why what, what what are your needs of your patients your community your site that's really where my, in my opinion telehealth shines is filling in gaps in your services that you have um when i first started doing this 10 plus years ago Behavioral health providers were afraid we were there to take their jobs. Like, oh, you're going to replace me with that? No, no, no. no. We're not going to replace anyone. We want to, we're going to fill in the gaps. You don't have child psychiatry. We'll give you child psychiatry. You don't have addiction psychiatry. We'll give you addiction psychiatry. We're not there to replace anyone's job. We're going to help your patients get services that either A, they were going without, or B, having to travel for. So think about that for your side. Um, for IHS is what are you spending your, your patient referred care funds on? What are you sending patients out for? And could you use telehealth to get that in, in your building? That could be amazing for your patients to do that. So be, it, you know, to take, to even kick back to these planning, planning stages, that's kind of what this toolkit will walk you through. Um, and then your site readiness. So do you already have equipment? Great. Do you have, and actually I think this is the next one, isn't it? Yeah. So in IHS, my understanding is the average age of our facilities in IHS is, uh, nine, they were built in 1979 on average. Very old by modern standards. Do you have, even have space for telehealth, telebehavior health? We come into sites all the time. They want our services. We want to give them services. They don't have any space for it. So, you know, I th you need to address some of these very basic things sometimes. Uh, you want page three, I'm oh, sorry. Um, is that what you were wanting, Cheryl? So, and I'll keep talking here. So, um, yeah, do you even have space for a telehealth office? Um, some sites don't. So, um, something to keep in mind there. Um, one of the things too that we really ask people is, is there a champion at your site? Just someone who really thinks telehealth is important. Oh, the telehealth definition, sorry. This is uh, Hearst's definition. I really like their definition here. I, I know I'll put a couple of other ones up. Um, Hearst's is I think a pretty um, nice one. It's pretty encompassing. It doesn't, um, you know, CMS is more focused on the billing side of it, but Hearst's is a little broader. And this could potentially encompass what we call, um, there's now mHealth you may have heard of. mHealth is more about um, using your phone for healthcare, apps that monitor your healthcare, also your uh, fitness devices, all that sort of falls under mHealth that we're not even gonna really talk about today. And also uh, remote patient monitoring is another thing um, that is out there that we're not really gonna touch on. It sometimes can apply to behavioral health. Um, they have, um, pill boxes where when it's opened and the patient takes the pill, you get a notification. This is for patients that may be on psych meds but aren't very compliant. Uh, it can be helpful um, for them to have remote patient monitoring on that. <laughs> yes, go Pokes. Actually, I, and I, I will say, I went to the University of Oklahoma for undergrad, so I'm, I'm really a Sooner at heart. So my parents were dismayed whenever I went to OSU. Had a great time though and got a great education. So nothing uh, bad to say about uh, Stillwater or the Pokes. Um, so uh, site stuff here, can the door be locked? Something you need to know. And by the way, let's think about this. So can the door be locked to protect the equipment? We're deploying services into a, a school, a BIE, 
the door locked on the inside, we got really concerned that maybe we don't want the kid to be able to lock us out. So we've actually turned it around now. Uh, so the kids can't lock us, lock the telehealth coordinator out of the session. So just think about that. If the door can be locked from the inside, do you have a key if the patient locks the door on you on purpose or accidentally? These tiny details really sort of make or break things, and there's a thousand of these, and these are just some of the some of these. Does the um, is it a confidential visit? And so this is a big lesson learned here from us. Whenever we do telebehavior health, what we find is both the provider and the patient tend to talk much louder, and so what we find is we have a a behavioral health office that's been fine and confidential, but now for telehealth, everyone in the waiting room can hear them because the patient's turned up the speakers on the computer, the provider's talking loud, the patient's talking loud. So is it, we've had offices that were confidential now or not. So what do you do about that? You, you know, you have to troubleshoot it. We, those little white noise baby sleep machines are great. That, that's usually all we need. We've actually had offices where it was the sound was bouncing through the vents and into another office. We actually had to redo the duct work uh, and put a big uh, L in it to get it to, to stop doing that. So, um, again, these little things. Um, one of the things that's kind of interesting, this last one here, when you're doing telehealth, white walls behind you is usually not the best. Most people wear light colored shirts and you blend in. So our recommendation is something like a robin's egg blue, something most clothing isn't that color and you really sort of stand out and pop from that background and that allows the patient to see you more clearly. So that's something that can be very helpful for patients, especially if maybe their eyesight isn't as good. Um, the other thing I would say, th this shirt I'm wearing would probably not be a great telehealth shirt. It has a lot of little fine lines. And sometimes those give a little wavery thing. You've probably all seen this on televideo stuff. If the lines are too close together. It causes a weird sort of moving pattern. You want more solid colors generally. So uh, things like that. Also, um, is your equipment or your computer on the emergency generator if the power goes out? If not, you may need what they call the UPS, an uninterruptible power supply. It's basically a big battery that sits on the ground. You plug your computer or televideo uh, equipment into. That way, if the computer goes out, or the, I'm sorry, electricity goes out, this session can continue. So something to think about. And there's a question about when the PowerPoint will be available. Um, hopefully soon, I'll, you know, the, the team will be working that out. I think we'll probably um, wrap things up here. I, I stress how important the telehealth coordinator position is. You can see we stress it here in our toolkit. And here are some of the duties that they would do. So people often ask, well, what do they do? Well, here you go. Here's basically everything we can think of after doing this for over a decade. Um, so, uh, you know, this will give you a good sense. It's not a hard job, but it's a very important job and something, you know, again, for folks to keep in mind. Um, the other piece of this is that your IT folks really have to be aware of when, it, when a telehealth session is happening. Um, that's part of the tele telehealth coordinator's job is to tell IT, oh, we're doing a session today. Is someone going to be in the office, right? Is someone here to support the program? So um, coordinating with your local IT folks in case there's an issue is going to be really important. All right. I, again, I think I'm going to pause here, see if there's any last minute questions. From any of my co-presenters, please add in. I, I know there's a wealth of knowledge in the audience and with um, the other um, panelists here. So would love to hear from any of you all. We don't have too much time, but I'm, I'm curious if people can chat in. Um, 
Does this, does this ring familiar with you? Did, has this been helpful? I just, I just have to reiterate, um, Dr. Ford, that this was a great presentation. I felt like you provided so much information that was super valuable. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to present. Mm -hmm. And someone asked about the, the toolkit. We're in a revision right now, but um, uh, as long as you all keep this as, and realize it's a draft copy, uh, I can email it to um, um, the hosts here and maybe you can make it available with the PowerPoint. I don't have an issue with that. It'll go live on our website hopefully in a week or two. Um, it's, it's mostly done, but there's still probably some corrections in language we need to deal with, but it's close enough as long as you all treat it as draft. Yeah. I think um, I, uh, maybe folks from the MHTTC team might give us an idea of when the, um, the recording and the um, slides will be posted and- Yes. I yeah. can do that. Thank you. And again, Dr. Four and everybody just organizing these topics are just been fantastic. And, and I'm newer to telehealth, but I will say uh, it really helps to have an engaging and informed speaker on these issues. And so far, I think we've done pretty well, but you, you really articulate these issues in a very keen and understandable way and bring up such good points. Um, around the resources that we're saving, you know, that especially hit home um, for what we might still do differently after the pandemic is over. Um, so as far as the processing, I did want to let folks know that um, I'm working with our team. In fact, right now, um, we, uh, with the pandemic and the remote uh, offices um, getting our video editing to get it uploaded um, so we can edit it to a um, manageable size and and um, make it worth your while um, that might take a little longer but we will absolutely I think before the end of this week get the slides up and any resources that you have sent us so especially uh, this draft um, toolkit that if you send that to us so um, please look forward to that there should be a way for us to reach out to you if you have attended either of these and we can just send you links to both of those if you are interested and as soon as we have the recordings we'll let you know as well great thank you and in the last two minutes i just want to call your attention to this last page i forgot this was here on our our toolkit a couple of very key components, the meet and greet, please do it. it. This is something we've established. It pays huge dividends. Basically, before we even start patient care, <clears throat> we get all, our provider and our staff meet with all of the staff that's going to be involved at that originating site. We want nurses. We want pharmacists. We want the lab tech. Anyone who may come in contact with our telehealth provider. And we sit down for at least an hour, sometimes as long as two hours, using the same equipment. And we just... We, it's just what it says, a meet and greet. Hey, here's our provider. Here's how they, they like to practice. How do you like to practice? It's really, we want our provider to be a part of their team and we want their team to feel like our provider is part of them. And so the meet and greet is sort of the huge first step into doing that. So if you get the chance, uh, make sure you do that. I have another thing here about testing and running mock clinics, begin page use dividends, and then some advice for launch day. Um, but this action step is something really important. And I think people often just want to jump in. I would encourage you not to do that. Do the meet and greet, get buy-in, get a face to go with this name they're going to be seeing in the electronic health record. Um, and just get, let people have a chance to chat with each other and it goes a long ways. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much again for your presentation today. It was wonderful. Just a reminder to folks who are attending in the chat, you can see some links to the um, the survey for evaluating the, the program of this, this two-part mini-series. Um, so please, if you could take a few minutes to give us some feedback, that would be great. And if you have any other additional comments or suggestions about further training needs related to telehealth or otherwise um, related to behavioral health, please do send that to us as well. Um, and I think that'll do it for today. So again, thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, and thank you to all of the panelists for helping organize this as well. I appreciate all the work and teamwork that went into putting this together. Everybody have a lovely day. Thank you.